Hello, I'm Alexander Lingus, the music director and founder of Capella Romana, and it's my real delight to have with me today a Siren Chalik, who's an assistant professor in the history department, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Marmara University in Istanbul. Uh, she obtained her PhD at the University of Birmingham, and her main research interests are in late Byzantine history, Byzantine literature, history writing, and daily life. And the reason she's with us today is because she's the author of a fantastic new book on the Emperor Manuel II, who is the subject of the forthcoming Capella Romana concerts, which are about his visit to the court of Henry IV in London, spending Christmas together in the year 1400. So, Professor Chelli, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So, um, how did you become interested in Manuel II? Well, I became interested in Manuel II when I was an undergraduate. I already uh, was decided on becoming a Byzantinist, and to that end, I was learning classical and Byzantine Greek. And uh, I actually translated one of Manuel's letters, incidentally, the one he composed from London, uh, into English as a practice. And as a result, I became really interested in Manuel as an author. Then I also translated the ecstasies that he also composed from Paris. And eventually, by the time I went to Birmingham for my MA, I decided that I would be studying him because I thought, what a fantastic figure. He's an emperor, he's an author, he's traveled to Europe. Wonderful. So actually, um, tell us then, um, well, you've talked about this voyage. Why don't, can you tell us when and how we undertook this voyage, which was unprecedented for an East Roman emperor, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I mean, before him, his father, John V, also had traveled to Buda and to Venice, also to Rome. But Manuel's journey, both when we think about it time frame wise and also the length, was really indeed unprecedented. Uh, well, uh, Manuel set out for his European tour in uh, 1399 because by that time, Constantinople had been under blockade by the Ottomans for almost five years, and he desperately needed to get help. Uh, prior to his visit, he had already been responding with several of these rulers in order to obtain military and financial help. And finally, King of France, Charles VI, sent Mavashar Bouchiso to Constantinople. So I believe, as does many other scholars, that Marechal Boussiso was instrumental in uh, convincing to Manuel uh, to go to Europe in person, because probably they believe that it would be more persuasive, more effective. And as a result, uh, in uh, 1399, finally Manuel did set out from Constantinople to take this grand tour. And it and was of course, a grand tour, wasn't it? <laughs> It was indeed because he stayed in Europe actually for three and a half years, quite a long journey. It's a long time and to be And he was only able to go back home, yes, uh, because the Ottomans were defeated at the Battle of Ankara by Tamerlane. So, yes, lucky, lucky save, but he didn't know that, of course, when he was setting off. Uh, indeed. So, in my book, too, I was wondering what would have been thinking when he was actually embarking out of from Constantinople, when you know the silhouette of his capital was fading, because when you come to think of it, there was actually quite a good chance that uh, he might not have an empire to return to. Indeed. So what you mentioned a letter already. So what kind of sources do we have that tell us about his travels? Well, uh, because Manuel was an author himself, we do have several letters, one from London and several others uh, that he composed, probably from Paris. We also have a big theological treatise on the procession of the Holy Spirit. Of course, it is a theological work, but on some rare occasions, Manuel does make references to his surroundings in Paris. He also has an ecrasis that he composed in Paris about a tapestry. Yes. Now, Manuel's works, yes, uh, they were composed in the Byzantine literary tradition, 
So uh, he puts how to say he gives more press importance to his aesthetic criteria rather than presenting his audience with details about his journey, like sites he has seen, people he met, or the food has he has eaten. But uh, thankfully, we have a variety of Western European sources at our disposal. So we have histories, we have chronicles, we have document collections, and their language really range from uh, Latin to medieval English, French, and Spanish. So these sources are really informative about Manuel's trip to uh, various cities in Europe. Uh, Byzantine historians like uh, Halko Kondilestu, uh, a later author, do touch upon these travels, but of course, since they were not an eyewitness, these are a bit problematic accounts at times. Sure. So you you so you've already mentioned how the uh, the King of France had been involved in uh, getting him over to Western Europe. Um, so then, how did he go all the way to England? Uh, well, uh, once he set out from Constantinople, he actually posed in the Moria because it was the Venetians who were transporting him with galleys. Then from Moria, uh, he went to Venice. And after Venice, he visited several Italian cities like Milan, uh, Pavia and Padua. Finally, he did travel to Paris and spent uh, the fall there. And uh, once he was there, we already know that he was corresponding uh, with the hospitalers in Ireland to arrange for a possible visit to England. Because, of course, it makes sense. It is not such a long journey, after all, when you have traveled all the way from Constantinople to Paris. Uh, Henry IV could have been a big contributor to a possible crusade against the Ottomans. And so pa Manuel probably did seize the opportunity to go to the court and to discuss his case in person. As Manuel's biographer, another reason I think is that uh, soon after Manuel arrives to Paris, uh, after he has spent some time at the French court, uh, we know that uh, King Charles VI again had one of his mental episodes mm -hmm. because the king had a mental episode, a uh, mental disease. Uh, so when I look at the sources, I also realize that uh, Manuel's plans and his visit to uh, England actually do coincide with the illness of King Charles VI. So maybe this was an additional motive for him to go. Actually, just a sort of a follow up there. It, I suppose, you know, our, our modern audiences were, you know, people were tend to thinking of, of people living in different parts of the world until recently as being very separate somehow, you know, because you had to take these long journeys. Um, but the, the fact that Manuel was already in contact with the King of France when he was in Constantinople, and then he's corresponding with the hospitalers who are knights who are involved in the Middle East, uh, you know, as the people to get him to talk to the King of England. It's it's really quite, you know, they're, everyone's involved with each other in, in quite remarkable ways, aren't they? Exactly, exactly. They are much, much more connected than we think, especially thanks to their diplomatic communications. Similarly, when he was already back in Constantinople, Manuel was also in correspondence with several Italian cities. He later corresponded with Spanish kingdoms. Uh, from Paris, he corresponded with the Queen of Denmark. So you're absolutely right. So, so then it, it's you know n not all that strange then that he then, what, especially since he was in the neighborhood, made it across the English uh, Channel then. I don't think so. I think it was a very, uh, you know, natural decision, probably. I mean, he had come that far. Mm -hmm. uh, he, by that time, by the way, he had been given very good promises in Paris that they would help Constantinople, that they would set up an army. So uh, we might never know what exactly he was thinking, but probably he was believing that once he crossed the England in person, uh, you know, he also would get similar promises. Also, we know that uh, Henry IV's predecessor, Richard II, had raised some funds to help Constantinople, but they never made it back to Constantinople. So perhaps Manuel also went to England to discuss that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also know that Henry IV did make some inquiries and recovered a portion of that money. Right. So, so 
he crosses the channel and what kind of experience did did Manuel and the, the group of people with him have? I mean, what were the reactions on both sides to this meeting of cultures? Well, first of all, it was, I think, quite a slow and eventful crossing uh, because there was some unrest at the uh, uh, Anglo-Scottish border. Manuel actually had to wait in Calais for about two months. From there, he crossed to Dover. And according to his letter, he had to cross and miss a storm, uh, which, of course, might be a literary convention, but also might be true because he did indeed cross in the winter. Uh, once he was there, he embarked on Dover, and then from there he was welcomed at Canterbury, and finally in Blackheath he met with Henry IV, and they proceeded to London together. And here all these wonderful English medieval documents come into play, uh, because we can read and uh, get information about all sorts of things, like how Manuel was entertained when he entered London by the Alderman of London, that there was a masquerade for him, uh, because the purchases made for these events are still uh, legible. And we know that soon after, he was uh, given a very lavish uh, Christmas feat at Elton Palace by Henry IV. Yes, and that, of course, the, the that uh, experience at Christmas is is the the focus of this concert and the and the recording coming up where we had two royal chapels in the same uh, in the same palace. Uh, exactly, and of course, we know especially by uh, from English chronicles like uh, Adam of Usk that Manuel and those who accompanied him were observing Orthodox rites. Uh, because, of course, not only Manuel was a Byzantine emperor, he was also a sincerely pious individual. And uh, all of the English chronicles do comment on these rites, because probably it did seem foreign to them. Uh, it was probably uh, one of the very rare occasions where they actually saw an orthodox rite. And they also note how pious Manuel and his entourage were, because they were very constant in attending these services. So this is something that certainly caught their eye. Uh, and of course, they also note his clothing. Like they say that all the men had long flowing beards. Of course, they were Orthodox Byzantines and they all were dressed in uniform, long clothes. And Adam of Ask also mentions that the emperor was dressed in white. Uh, so clearly their appearance and their rights uh, was rather interesting for the English at the time. No, and it, it really again. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the the Byzantine sources that comment on those some of those aspects in the same way. But but I I know that um, in the field of musical scholarship, there's been a lot of work that's been done on the next century of how English music interacted with Western European continental music that the Council of Constance and, and and various things, or later that century, I should say, since it was 1400, right at the beginning of it. Uh, but, um, but this really is a, a kind of remarkable event. And so... Um, so Emperor Emmanuel, too, I mean, he had personal interactions with Henry, didn't he, as well? Oh, yes. I mean, because also from his sole surviving letter from London, he really gives us a glowing picture of the king, that he was gracious, uh, really, you know, hospitable. And he says that King Kangri is almost the ruler of a second Achaemeni. So this is a very high compliment coming from a Byzantine emperor because Achaemeni is the, you know, uh, traditionally it is either the uh, Orthodox world or the Byzantine empire. And that is a big compliment. And he gives us a very, very positive portrait of Henry IV. Uh, probably because uh, by that time, the English king had also given him lots of promises. And we know that he did entertain and host Manuel brilliantly. Uh, for example, Manuel also probably stayed at Alton Palace uh, because a gilded bed was brought there on King Henry IV's orders. Uh, we know that other sorts of tournaments were held in his honor. Uh, he was given president uh, presents. And of course, Manuel gave relics to Henry IV as a token of his esteem, uh, pieces from a holy tunic. So yeah. we know that they did interact. Yes, that was a very, very uh, precious gift that was the English chroniclers took some note of that, didn't they? Oh, yes, they did. And by the way, Manuel also did give a uh, 
pieces uh, from several relics to other European rulers like the Duke of Milan, uh, King of France, uh, his uncle Jean de Very, the famous art collector. He sent them to Aragon, uh, also to Denmark. And this many scholars, including myself, believe that uh, was a way of Manuel's, you know, highlighting the importance of Constantinople for the Christian world. Indeed, no, that it, it's so remarkable, actually, that the, uh, you mentioned, you know, Adam of Usk and so on, that they, even so far away after so many centuries from the, the founding of, of the empire, they still have this consciousness of who it is that has come to visit them and, and, and his past. Indeed. Indeed, and uh, you, you sense from them a sense of sort of admiration for Manuel. And you can also find similar sentiments echoed in French sources, like the Chronicle of Saint-Denis. Uh, like the English sources, uh, they also underline the fact how sad it is that such a great ruler has been reduced to such a plight. Uh, but there is also this sense of mystery and mystique about Manuel, this Byzantine emperor or the emperor of Greeks coming all the way from... Uh, you know, uh, Constantinople in his, uh, with his long beard and long clothes and interesting rides. And many of them do comment on how dignified Manuel also looked. No, mar marvelous. So, um, and then he 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 then left uh, England about when did he, he leave? How did he make his way home? Well, he had a, a relatively short visit to England. So he stayed there about two months. But we also know that some people who were in his entourage when he was in England stayed on uh, because the expense book of the English court says that they uh, stayed behind and they were given tours of various English cities. But Manuel only stayed for two months and we really don't know that much about his experiences like the sights he saw. I mean, assumably, he did see the Tower of London or the London Bridge. He did see probably the Westminster Hall, which was one of the greatest in Europe at the time. Uh, likewise, for the Christmas feast, we really don't know what sort of food they ate. And as a historian with an interest in food, this really, you know, infuriates me. <laughs> uh, so, for example, when we compare it with the uh, list of the banquet for uh, Henry IV's coronation, they probably had luxury foods like roast venison, jelly, peacocks, and subtleties. So, like models of animals and castles being paraded around. But sadly, Manuel is completely silent about these experiences. But basically, he stayed there for about two months, and afterwards, he did uh, return to uh, Paris, where he was to stay for quite a long time. Actually, you know, as you're saying about being a little infuriating that you some of those sources don't speak, because my my office uh, at City of University of London was just up the street from where Manuel stayed after he left Eltham Palace. It was just so, so, so Clarkenwell was just, you know, a, yeah. was a five minute walk away. And so that once sort of getting myself getting into this research and learning about it and, and, and realizing, you know, that I was walking around where he was walking around and I wonder what he saw at the time. Indeed, it is such a wonderful experience. And uh, I live in Istanbul. I also get this feeling when I'm visiting parts of the old city. But I agree, it is infuriating because I wish we had more knowledge about food, sites, people he met, conversations, and so on and so forth. Actually, what... Well, uh, but the... speaking about... Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, speaking no. about rights and music, one other interesting anecdote from Manuel's travels is that we know from 16th century, from the writings of Cuthbert Tunstall, uh, he says that he chanced upon a book that spoke about the visit of Emperor Manu to England, and presumably during their stay, Manuel and his entourage were questioned by some uh, English members of the court uh, about the language of the scriptures, because here they are speaking Greek. We know that originally the scriptures are in Greek, so apparently they were asked back home in Constantinople, do, does the populace understand it when the scriptures are being recited or is the language spoken now different? And of course, the Byzantines reply that now it is different. Yes, speaking Romaic, uh, sort of a version on the way Indeed. to modern Greek. Yes. But yeah. this is a rather, you know, striking, I would say, cultural interaction. 
Well, because you dealt so much with Manuel's sort of literary production, his letters and and so on. I mean, he wrote in a in a very exalted form of Greek, didn't he? Oh yes. So uh, he was, of course, following the sort of uh, how to say regulations and the rules of a uh, uh, high uh, elevated Byzantine literature. So they they did not write in vernacular in Romaica in the language he spoke daily. But he still wrote in Attic Greek, as if he was Plato or, uh, you know, Demosthenes. <laughs> no, just, just. So uh, he wrote in Attic Greek, and I find that he was also quite an accomplished author. Mm -hmm. Yes, because you, you, I mean, you're, you're actually one of the things about your book is that you, um, and what distinguishes it from some of the earlier scholarships, that you root yourself very much in his own writings. I mean, more generally, what kind of an author was he like? Well, it was uh, originally wanted me to a study of Manuel II, but well, he's quite an interesting author, first, because he's an emperor author. I mean, we also have several examples in Byzantium, but they're not that common. And Manuel, uh, he also lived a very long life. He lived for 75 years, uh, very impressive for the 15th century. He also wrote so much in so many different genres, like we have letters, Poetry, theological treatises, philosophical works, uh, you know, rhetorical exercises. And uh, especially for the audience, we even have a canon, a hymn composed by Manuel. He composed it in 1411, whilst Constantinople was besieged by yet another uh, Ottoman uh, general, uh, by the uh, son of Bayezid, Bayezid who was uh, besieging Constantinople when Manuel was away in Europe. Uh, so uh, he was quite versatile and uh, wrote, uh, produced an amazing array of genres. Well, and actually to, to write a canon, because the canon depends on knowing certain musical tunes that go with each uh, sort of uh, stanza of poetry, each that they have to match the meters. So again, that indicates that he had some interest and in, uh, specific in sort of musical genres as well. Indeed, indeed. And uh, I'm not a specialist in musicology, so I couldn't tell. Uh, but when I, you know, showed the canon to specialists in uh, Byzantine music, they actually told me that it was pretty impressive and well written. And we also know from other Byzantine sources that Manuel was really interested in chanting and listening to hymns, which, of course, again, might be a literary convention to create this image of the spies emperor. But I think it would fit very well with his overall image. Well, I think it fits overall well too. You're sort of putting on my musicologist hat of 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 that with what we have in the in the manuscripts, because although it, it's sort of infuriating also that that we don't have an exact description of we his description, we went and we performed these while we were at Eltham Palace in London. Um, that the musical manuscripts are very, very rich with with hundreds of compositions that which many which have come out from the court musicians at the time of Manuel, from his reign. So, so actually that's one of the things putting together this concert that we were able then, because there's enough music that we know was produced under his reign and would have been sung in his chapel, that there was plenty to choose on. Yeah, and he also composed one himself. So yeah, I think so, uh, overall when I rate him, I think he's a very noteworthy uh, author in the Byzantine literary tradition because he is writes beautifully, has beautiful imagery, metaphors, and a very nuanced and diverse self-presentation. Wonderful. So is there anything else you think that our viewers should know or understand about Manuel for the moment before we come back to some sequel, perhaps with his canon? Well, I was going to mention the canon, but we already did mention it. So, okay, he was also a composer. This we have covered. Uh, well, I mean, I think the audience should know upon his first journey to Europe, the rest of the time in Manuel's life too, it's always very interesting and eventful. He endures civil wars, uh, civil strife. He actually has to accompany the Ottoman sultans on his campaigns, holds talks there with Amidevis, an Islamic theologian. So he quite had a very eventful and rich life. Uh, and I think another thing is that, apart from being a rather accomplished author, Manuel, I believe, was also a capable emperor. He did rule at rather unfortunate times, uh, but I think uh, as an emperor, he really made the best with the resources he had. 
No, I, I'd, I'd agree that he's a really a remarkable figure. And actually, that's one of these areas, like those people who study sort of art and also music, that from that period, even though the empire was shrinking, um, that it was still such a, a time of such great artistic and intellectual production, really, and that uh, manual is, an, is a real example of that. Indeed, indeed. And overall, I mean, he's really set up the crossroads of Byzantine, Ottoman, uh, Renaissance and Western European history. So he really is a quite fascinating figure. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I mean, I'm in Greece, you're in Istanbul. The concerts are happening in Portland, Seattle, and Eugene <laughs> coming up. But uh, so we're having our own sort of pilgrimages and across the world. Uh, but it was a real pleasure speaking with you. And I look forward to continuing perhaps our conversations in the future. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was an absolute pleasure for me and I wish the best of success to all of the concerts. Uh, I wish I were in the United States so I could have attended. <laughs>